Well, good morning and welcome to Easter at Fusion. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, I have a little bit of bad news for you this morning as we begin the message time. Uh, with the new lights on the stage, I didn't realize this till just now, but I can see you better with these other lights at me. So if you fall asleep today, I may come over and, and, and point you out. So I'm just, just kind of warning you. No, I'm just kidding. I won't do that. So if you, can't, if you came planning to catch a nap this morning for a long day, you can, you can feel free to do that. My wife does that most Sundays anyway. So um, she's not here. Don't tell her I said that, okay? Uh, you know, Easter Sunday is the most important day every year for the church. It stands out from the rest because today is symbolic of the event that launched the fire of the church of Jesus Christ. See, it wasn't the birth event, the manger. That wasn't what launched the, the, the gospel message. It's not what launched the church into a global movement. It didn't ignite the fire. It wasn't the miracles Jesus performed. It wasn't even the death of Jesus that ignited the fire of the church. In fact, right after Jesus is dead, you read the account in the Gospels, secular historians tell us that the people following close, closest to Jesus were afraid, they were scared, they didn't know what came next, they were confused, they were bewildered, they were, some of them running for, them, for their lives, leaving Jerusalem. All hope was lost, but on Easter, eyewitness testimony started to come in from hundreds who saw Jesus face to face, yet he was crucified three days earlier. Resurrected from the grave, fully restored. Hundreds who heard his voice speak again after being beaten, crucified, killed, dead and buried Friday. Now they heard him speak to them, appearing in the middle of a locked room even, to a crowd where they could reach out with their hands and touch the holes in his hands, revealing his resurrected self to them with new hope about the future to come. Before the resurrection, Jesus was a rabbi. He had a lot of great, great things to say. He was a great teacher. He was a compassionate man that loved the unlovable in that world. He had power over diseases and infirmities. He was able to perform miracles that people couldn't understand or explain. But once he was crucified, he was, just seemed to be like any other guy. Limited, vulnerable, easily overwhelmed, gone before his time until he began to appear risen again to hundreds of people and Jesus reveals that he was not just a man after all but he was something more than that that he even had the power over his own life and his own grave when it ended he came back from death in the Roman world 2,000 years ago these eyewitness stories of resurrection in the months to follow they wouldn't just be assumed true so be careful when you read or think about the book of Acts you're like yeah people they said this people just believed it no they didn't the testimonies were scrutinized. Those who heard would be skeptical of such a crazy science fiction claim. If, if one person came up to you this week and they saw you and, and they said, hey, I just, I, I talked to your mom or your dad or your grandma or grandpa this week, like I heard them, I saw them, they were there, you would ask them, what medication have you been on and why have you stopped taking it, right? You would say, there's something off here. You'd think they'd lost their mind. But but if someone came up and told you they had talked to someone who had recently died and then someone else said something too and they don't even know that person and then all of a sudden the next day a third person came up with a similar story and they don't know the first or second person and then a fourth and in the course of a week or ten days you and your neighbor and somebody else have all heard these different stories but all kind of saying the exact same thing all of a sudden you step back and you can't deny there is something going on here that is greater than the natural natural order of things. Over a 40-day period, somewhere near 500 eyewitness testimonies of the risen Jesus would begin to be shared. Many of those who claimed to witness the resurrection Christ would be pressed by the public with questions when they spoke publicly about what they saw. Some believers would even be pressured by the government or by religious leaders under threats of violence or property seizure or imprisonment. That if they didn't renounce this story of resurrection publicly, those things would happen to them. And even many more would actually be tortured and executed because of their refusal to alter their resurrection testimony of Jesus. And that entire time, there was one piece of evidence that could have been produced to prove that the claims of resurrection were false. A corpse. 
The dead corpse of Jesus, if it could have been produced, would have brought a complete stop to the spread of any other resurrection stories. But the Romans couldn't produce it. Why? Because Jesus was alive. And, and if, if a corpse gets up and walks around, it's hard to produce it as evidence that they haven't gotten up and walked around. When one guy says before he dies he's going to let the people opposing him, that, that he's going to walk right through the front gates, he's going to let them capture him, he's going to let them kill him, so that he can come back from the grave three days later, and then that guy actually pulls it off, that event will spark a massive movement. It'll create a fire. And in the first three centuries after Jesus pulls off Easter, the gospel message of hope, shared by his earliest disciples, begins to spread through a bunch of no-named nobodies whose lives are turned upside down through faith. Jesus' disciples were underdogs in their world. Do you like underdog stories? Don't you think there's something about the human spirit that just loves underdog stories where the cards are stacked against someone, someone that's not quite as strong or not quite as smart or not quite as good looking or doesn't have as many resources as maybe the, the main character or even the main villain in a story. Normally the underdog is too young, too inexperienced, handicapped or, 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 or battling something that, that keeps them at bay in some way when it comes in comparison to the man antagonist of a story. And our collective history is filled with these stories. They capture our hearts, both fictional stories and non-fictional stories. Do you have a favorite underdog story? I mean, there's so many amazing true life underdog stories of seemingly insignificant people who rise through the ranks to make an impact on the world. People like Nelson Mandela or Mother Teresa. There's, there's so many underdog stories in the world of sports, if you love sports. One that is consistently uh, communicated through surveys as like the most significant underdog story in sports is the U.S. Olympics in 1980, right? Miracle on Ice. Just an incredible story. There's other stories of those in entertainment that failed, at, had failure after failure after failure after failure before they had a little bit of success. One like Walt Disney. An incredible underdog story. But fictional underdog stories seem to have overwhelmed our modern culture in these last five decades. And what I think we love the most about underdog stories is the underdog heart, the heart of the underdog. There's something about our favorite underdogs that's compelling because they have a purity of heart, unlike so many of the main characters around them. We see this in naive hobbits from the Shire and the Lord of the Rings. We see it in a young, inexperienced, orphaned wizard whose parents have died named Harry Potter facing off against the Dark Lord. <laughs> or a deeply oppressive world turned upside down, being challenged by a young girl named Katniss that loves her little sister in the Hunger Games. But then there's the greatest underdog story of all time. Rocky Balboa. <laughs> I don't even like to run and this makes me want to jog, right? Run the steps in Philadelphia. Rocky has such a... Yeah, we're going to listen to the whole thing. No, I'm just kidding. You can bring it down, Jeff. Uh, Jeff really likes that song, so... Rocky has this simple yet determined heart. The tale of underdogs who have no status, no reason for greatness, little chance of winning against superior adversaries is the theme of entire film series. It's like, if you really step back, now some of you might be offended by this, so I, I put that as a warning. If you really step back, when you look at like Jurassic Park and Star Wars, like it's the same story over and over again. This big mighty enemy, this small little piddly, you know, nincompoop out of nowhere. <laughs> rises, right? It's giant dinosaurs, and yet somehow people escape and overwhelm them, and it's little Luke Skywalker, and they just keep making the same movie over and over and over again, and, and they just do it in a slightly different way. But they're built on that same underdog fabric. It's told over and over again, different colors and characters. You look at most of the animated films that come out. It's the unassuming, ostracized, alienated one that no one would think of that rises to become the hero sequel after sequel, movie after movie, book series after book series, repackaged in a different context. But they consistently, the writers set us up to fall in love and root for the underdog. 
And I think the connection we have with these underdog stories is because you and I, we often feel like underdogs in our own story. We don't have status. We don't have infinite resources. We are far from perfect. We don't have superpowers. We're limited. We've made mistakes. We've had failure. We know we have flaws. And if we're honest, really honest, we're easily overwhelmed. And we don't like to admit it. Even this week, unless you've been living under a rock, you may not know there's a new comic book superhero movie coming out with the Avengers. And the reason for this sequel is because an entire team of like 87 superheroes unite together to stop one guy. Like I have a picture on the screen, that's only like one eighth of the number of superheroes that try to take out this one guy. Spoiler alert, they don't. So now there's a sequel where they get a second chance to come back and do the whole movie all over again and make a billion more dollars. So, And that means that this week, across the country, millions of guys will wander up from the basements of their parents that they live in <laughs> and dress up like their favorite superhero. Oh, I'm, there it is. I was going to say, that might be me, that might not be. I, I'm not going to tell you the truth. So, But millions of people, once again this week, be going to the movie theater to root for the underdog. Did you know the Bible's filled with true accounts of so many underdogs? Some even say the God of Scripture is the God of the underdog. I don't know what you think about when you consider the Bible. This year for us as a church, we've started at the beginning of this collection of books, and we've been working our way through in the order in which things played out in history. And you see quickly that these are not stories of superheroes who have the world on a string. The people who lived and whose lives are recorded in the Bible are not people born with status or privilege, but rather the books in the Bible are filled with stories of flawed human beings, underdogs that had the odds stacked against them. Even last week we talked about how so many of them are immigrants in a foreign land trying to figure out life, trying to be obedient to God. People like Noah, they believed God had spoke to him about a construction project, but those around him thought he was crazy and discounted him until it started to rain, and then they wanted to get on his boat. People like Abraham, who was a self-centered nobody that God chose to give a child to that would be the father and patriarch of an entire nation known as Israel. People like Joseph, a deeply loved son betrayed by his own brother, sold as a slave, only to be forced into an Egyptian prison for a crime he didn't commit so that God could elevate him to a place, role of second in command over all of Egypt and rescue thousands from certain death. People like Moses who grew up in a palace, grew up with privilege, but through that began to see he wanted nothing to do with leadership, nothing to do with that life. So he ran away until God called him, chose him to return home to where he grew up and lead a revolution against the very people, the powerful nation that raised him. People like Joshua, or Gideon, or Deborah, or Ruth. People of no real standing, no real significance, until God taps them on the shoulder and uses them in powerful ways. I actually want to invite you, if you're new to Fusion, or, or you don't even have a clue what I just talked about there, we're only 11 weeks in. Today is week 11 through the Bible. And you can jump online this week. We have web links all over our website for a YouTube video of just the message. You can use Facebook and watch the entire service. You can use one of the most effective ways, I think, is when you're driving. You can download the podcast on your Wi-Fi at home through Google Play or, or iTunes. You can download the, t the audio teaching and play it. If you work 15 minutes from home, it's about, you can watch, listen to half of it on the way to work and half of it on the way back or on your morning commute or whatever, and you can catch up really, really quickly and just get a better understanding of these individuals whose lives are captured in Scripture. But you'll see quickly that these people couldn't find success because of their own abilities, not of their own strength or fortitude or resources, but that there was definitely a power of God at work behind them. And as a result, the glory for their success wasn't something they could actually stand and say, I did that. But all of them would say, I could never do that. Nowhere in the Old Testament is this more easily recognizable than in the story of the life of David. Especially where David's story begins. See, the people of God had been fruitful and multiplied, which basically is translated to mean they made a lot of babies. So they made babies. And what once was a large extended family, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, now has grown many generations later to become an incredible nation of people. 
and the collective culture of the nation of Israel, they know the stories that have been told. They, they know the history of their people, but they've just grown tired of following a God that's invisible. They want a man in that position. They want a man they can follow. They looked around at other nations and they saw royal monarchy, royal monarchy, royal monarchy, which means king, 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 king. Every other nation had a king. And so the nation of Israel, like a six-year-old child that wants to play with a toy their sister has, begins to whine to the prophet Samuel, called by God to speak for God. And they're like, Samuel, tell God that we want a king. We want a king. Everybody else has a king. We want a king. I I I I I want a ring pop. I want a ring pop. My sister has a ring pop. Why don't I get a ring pop? Well, after words of warning, you can't have a ring pop. You don't want a ring pop. Trust me. This will not go well for you if you have a king. God says, you know what you've asked? I'm going to give you what you ask for, and you're not going to like it. And so he sends Samuel to select a man named Saul to be their king. Now, King Saul looks like a king. Tall, strong, commanding, a great warrior that you would follow into battle. In fact, if you were picking teams on the playground, you would want someone that looks like this, that looks like King Saul, someone that looks like a titan of athleticism. There should be a picture coming up, and it's late. Maybe it's not coming up. There it is. That's who you would want on your team. King Saul would be your first pick. Pastor Corey would be your second pick. He looks like a king. But looks can be deceiving. I'm talking about David and Saul. I'm not talking about Corey anymore, okay? (laughs) An effective leader is not measured by what you see on the outside. A good man or a good woman is revealed not by their outward appearance, but by their heart. If you know anything about our children's pastor, Pastor Tim, he's one of the kindest, gentlest, biggest hearted guys you could ever meet. Now, am I saying Corey doesn't have a good heart? No, I'm not. I'm just picking on Corey, having fun with him. But that heart of an underdog is what's so attractive to us. It's why we're compelled by those stories. And so for a little while, things go well with Saul's king, but soon he turned out to be a king like most kings. The power had begun to corrupt his heart. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. He became proud and self-willed. He used his position of power to serve himself rather than the people that he was called to lead through serving. He was using and abusing people. He was bending the laws of God whenever it suited him. And eventually it leads to the point where God says, no longer, I reject Saul as king. His disobedience continually has caused me to sever his title and position. And so he told the prophet Samuel, I want you to go and I'm going to lead you to a new king. And so God sends Samuel to the house of a man named Jesse. Jesse, if you've been walking through the story of scripture with us, you might remember we talked about just two weeks ago, is the grandson of Ruth, the Moabite, and her husband, the Jewish man, Boaz. Well, Samuel knocks on the door, uh, Jesse opens the door. Samuel says, hey, God sent me here to anoint one of your sons to be the new king. He's rejected King Saul. And so Jesse says, one of my sons? Are you kidding me? Wow, this is amazing. I know exactly which one it is. Come here, let me show you. He brings him into the living room. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, the firstborn, and thought, surely the anointed, the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Samuel, in essence, he walks into Jesse's living room and he sees Eliab. And he says, wow, that guy just looks like a king. Samuel kind of looks at Eliab and he sees to what he appears to, it looks like Captain America, like this is an incredible leader people would want to follow. Or he looks at Eliab and he thinks this guy's like the rock. I mean, just a, a massive man, like a, somebody that would be a warrior, uh, somebody like a, you know, a John Keenan that sings on the worship team. You're like that guy looks like a king. I'd follow John anywhere. Go John. But, but God's focus is the heart. What God is looking for in you is your heart. You have to know someone very well to know their heart. What kind of heart do you have? What's the condition of your heart? Is it the kind of heart that God is looking for to bless? Honorable, pure, honest, transparent, without an agenda or without self-centered motive? Not meaning you're perfect, but daily you're, you're continuing to say, this is not going to be the life I want to live. This is not what I want my life to be marked by. This is not the kind of heart I want to cultivate. 
Or is your heart the kind of heart God would reject? Like Saul's, manipulative, scheming, power-hungry, deceptive, self-centered, and agenda-driven. Now, Samuel really should have known better before he spoke this about Eliab. I mean, after all, do you remember Saul, Sam? Right? He looked the part, but there's so much more that was missing integrity, character, that's vital to the authority of being given the role of king. God is saying, Sam, are you really going to make this mistake again? God says, listen, Sam, when I look for leaders, I don't value what people typically value. I'm not after the pretty face. I don't look at people and say, wow, they know how to... They know how to dress. Wow, they have an impressive resume. Wow, they look good. No, he looks at beauty here and here alone. So let me ask you before we move on, most mornings of your life, how much time do you spend preparing your heart? Some of us spend a lot more time obsessing about what we look like on the outside. Working out, shopping online to find deals, to wear things that flatter our appearance to dress correctly or or saying the right things or maybe even doing the right things but with the wrong motives so that it makes us look better. I mean, some of us spent a lot of time this morning in that very struggle. But see, God looks at the heart, purity, humility, compassion, honor. People quick to admit their failure and sin and ask for forgiveness and people quick to give forgiveness away. So Samuel says to a surprised Jesse, well, God's not chosen Eliab. You have another son? Jesse says, well, how about this one? Sam says, nope, God hasn't chosen that one either. He says, okay, well, how about this one? Three, four, five, six, seven sons later, the prophet Samuel says, no, 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 no. Is this it? Is this all your sons? And Jesse starts to count, five, six, seven. And then he's like, oh, no, there's one missing, the youngest. The run of the litter, I I didn't even bring him before you. He's out taking care of the sheep. Now, the lowest job in the whole nation of Israel, the whole culture at that time was being a shepherd. So if the task of shepherd was assigned to someone, it meant that your family really didn't think that highly of you. Do you see that even Jesse, David's father, has discounted David so much based on his outward appearance and his place in the birth order? And yet, as soon as David is presented to Samuel, God makes it abundantly clear. The Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. As their jaws hit the floor, him. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. The next lineage of kings that would come from the line of David would not be successful because of any inward awesomeness in David. That was not why God chose David. It was not because he'd be a great warrior. He'd be someone great that they could follow. No, success, if David experienced any of it, would be based on the Spirit of God at work in David's heart. In fact, David will be filled with the Spirit of God because David was not full of himself. If you're full of yourself, there's no room for the Holy Spirit. But if you empty yourself, boy, that's a playground the Holy Spirit can use. What follows is the underdog story of all time. The underdog story that all other underdog stories are measured against. In fact, if you were to tell someone an underdog story this afternoon at lunch, you might even start with saying, oh, I got to tell you something. And this, man, this is a real David and Goliath kind of thing. I assume you know the story. The little boy steps out onto the battlefield, disobeying his father's command to run at the first sight of danger. No, no, no. This day, this boy is going to disobey his dad and step right out in the middle of the action. The sling spins, the stone flies, the giant falls, the sword is drawn, the head is decapitated. And the army of Israel on the hill behind him in the valley of Allah, not a person in their ranks believing 12 seconds ago they had any hope of victory with the kid out there in the middle of the field, they go from hopeless, defeated, and lost in one second to inspired and energized for victory the next. And they blitz the field in a chase to, 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 to destroy the Philistines. So here's the big question. What's the main point of this story? What's the main point of this story? Well, is it that the bigger they are, the harder they fall? Because you've probably heard that application before. The bigger they are, the harder they fall? No. Is it that there, there's always hope for the underdog? So... Don't stop Never stop believing in yourself. Hold on to that feeling, right? Or how about, you know, if you trust God, if you just trust God, God will give you victory over all the giants in your life. 
whether it be a sports team or a lousy job or a bad boss or financial battle or relationship or cancer, you'll always have victory if you just trust God. And I've heard these applications before, and none of them are the main point of this story. How do we know? Because we haven't talked about Jesus yet. See, a mistake we often make is, is we can think about a story in the Bible, we can think about an event in the history captured in the pages of Scripture, even in the Old Testament, and think we figured it out, thinking it's about David or thinking it's about me. But if we do this and we stop there, we're wrong, because see, God gave us the Bible in its written form as a gift to us for one reason alone, and that's to unveil his son, Jesus. That we would see Jesus all throughout the pages of his word. Because in the beginning was the word Jesus. The word was with God. The word was God. Jesus is God from the very beginning. See, Jesus was God's number one plan. The tomb, it's empty. The simple, unassuming underdog carpenter that slays the greatest giant enemy of humanity. Death and separation from God. God's son given to us to show us who God is and to ultimately slay the giant we could never defeat. Death. Jesus' death overwhelms death. His death changes our outlook on death. And as you grow in knowledge about Jesus, this is why reading the stories captured in the pages of the Bible, especially the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts, what happens immediately after Jesus' resurrection, they're so huge. Because as we learn more about who Jesus is, how he treated people, what he had to say, and his heart, as we know more about Jesus' heart, it's the same thing that happens when you watch a movie of an underdog and you see their heart on screen. When you open up you know, the seventh book in a 27-book series and, and you get more familiar with the heart of the character at the center, the underdog. When you open God's word and you begin to discover Jesus, your affection for him, you begin to adore him because you recognize this is not someone that's made up in someone's imagination. He lived this way. He treated people this way. He died this way. And he rose again. The Bible is not a collection of heroes whose examples were to try to emulate in our own power. The Bible is God's gift to us to discover that our greatest need in all of life is we need a savior. We cannot save ourselves. David was a simple shepherd who became the king of Israel, but even David's existence is a precursor to the arrival of the Son of God. When Jesus arrives, he's a small, unassuming carpenter boy who faces the biggest giant, the real giant, our sin and the curse of death. As our representative, on our behalf, while we stood on the hillside watching like cowards, doing nothing else to help him, as our representative, Jesus lives the life we should have lived. As our representative... Jesus dies the death we were condemned to die. And just like David, Jesus was opposed by all his brothers and sisters, abandoned by everyone at the moment of battle. He walked out onto the battlefield alone, the hill of Calvary, and he conquered the giant all by himself. And now we, as brothers and sisters, we get to blitz the field with confidence. The victory has already been won. The real giant in our lives, our real Goliath, is not a person standing against us. It's not a circumstance or a situation. It's not a diagnosis or a financial condition. Our real, Goli our real Goliath that we face, the real battle, is alienation from God and the penalty we owe for sin. The giant is something Jesus brought crumbling down all on his own. And he brought death to the giant by his death and resurrection. You know, 2,000 years ago when God chose to step out of the heavens and into earth, he chose to do it in the most unlikely place, really the armpit of the Middle East. And he said all along, this is where it would happen. It would happen in the region of Bethlehem. And when he chose to step into mortality as a man, he didn't set himself up in a position of power or authority or influence. He didn't choose someone with wealth. He chose a humble labor worker, a carpenter, to put on display the presence, identity, and power of who God is. And through Jesus, God shows us his purity of heart, his love, especially through his sacrifice for us. And see, it's the heart of Jesus alone that has the power to transform our hearts. And you need a transformed heart. I need a transformed heart every single day because there's a war happening right now in our heart. One of the things we have to understand is that the way we think about in the West, the heart 
is incomplete. The way we hear the heart referenced in culture and media is incredibly incomplete. I love Tim Keller. If you're aware at all of, of author, teacher, pastor Tim Keller, uh, who, who God has used powerfully at Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City. Um, here's something that, that he wrote that he shares on his blog. I love this about the human heart. Follow along with me on the screen, and we'll share the link to this because I have a feeling many of you are going to be like, I got to see that. I got to chew on that. That is really good. We'll, we'll share this with you through email. For modern people, we believe our deepest feelings are who we really are, and we must not repress or deny our deepest feelings. Step back. Culturally, we believe the greatest human struggles between the emotions and a repressive society that stands in the way of self-expression and realization. Here's the conflict, the rub. The Bible teaches neither. Do you see this? He's saying there's a conflict between the message of our world and even our own opinions with the Bible. The Bible teaches neither. It says the human struggle happens within a single entity, the human heart. The main human struggle is not between the heart and something else, but between forces that tear the heart in different directions. The great battle is deciding to what? Your heart's greatest love, hope, and trust will be directed. Three powerful words. The heart, to us English speakers, means the emotions. But the Bible also says our thinking comes from the heart with references, as well as our willing, our plans, our decisions with references. This confuses us until we realize the Bible's view of human nature is revolutionary. It's different from what you find in other human systems of thought. The heart is used as a metaphor for what we trust the most. It is what we love and hope in, what we most treasure, what captures our imagination. And every heart has an inclination, something it is directed toward. The direction of the heart then controls everything else, our thinking, feeling, decisions, and actions. Whatever we cherish in our hearts most controls the whole person. No wonder Jesus is so concerned about our hearts. No wonder God ignores outward matters and looks supremely at the heart. No wonder the prophets said that the goal of salvation is not compliance with the law, but having the law written on the heart through spiritual rebirth. We always, in the end, do what the heart wants the most. You can't change merely by changing your thinking or through great acts of will, but rather by changing what you love most. We change when we change what we worship the most. How do we do that? By seeing that Jesus' own heart was crushed and broken as he died on the cross for us. It is as we worship a crucified Savior that our hearts are transformed. The bottom line, all of us need a heart transplant because we can't trust our own desires. We can't follow our heart because our heart is torn in different directions. It wars inside of us those desires. And the only hope we can find over that war, the only peace from that war comes from letting God's heart revealed to us through Christ and in the power of His Holy Spirit begin to transform our heart. Remember, God is most interested in your heart. He says so with David. He says it to Samuel. Samuel almost loses sight. This is the prophet of God, and he forgets this truth. And when he sees Eliab, he's like, this is the guy. And God's like, Sam, what are you doing? You're making the same mistake again. It's not about what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside that matters. And under our own power, we can't create in us a clean heart, a pure heart heart we need a power far superior than ours maybe someone who has the power over death to transform our heart you know Jesus will be referred to in the scope of ministry as the son of God but he'll also be referred to as the son of David David will be singled out he'll be isolated in the story of Israel's history as the direct descendant of Jesus himself David will even be referred to is the man after God's own heart helping us to see when we look at David we can see the heart of Jesus his future descendant see David was filled with the spirit of God because David was not full of himself and 28 generations later when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River the Holy Spirit will descend and Jesus journey to the cross 
an empty tomb will begin. Jesus is filled with love for you. And he reveals it as he empties himself out for you. God's epic redemption story is all about pointing to Jesus, his son. His arrival, his life, his death, and most importantly, what brings hope. The event that ignited the fire of revival across the planet over 2,000 years ago. The resurrection. And you're a big part of his story. The question is, what do you believe today, now? Have you said yes in faith to Jesus? Because on the surface, in human form, he looked like an underdog. The reality is he was the champion all along. There was nothing that could thwart God's design or plan for his one and only son. I want to invite you, if you would, just to bow your head and close your eyes. And, and I want to give you the opportunity today to not look with religion at Jesus, to not look through the lens of tradition at Jesus. But I want to ask you to look through the, the lens of your heart. What, what do you fundamentally believe about Jesus Christ? What do you believe? Do you believe that it's all a myth, it's all a fable? You have the choice right now. That, that's the way God wants it. He, he wants a relationship with you, and a true relationship, love, is only possible because we have the freedom to choose to engage in relationship. Or do you believe He's the Son of the living God? Do you believe that His heart shows us the heart of God the Father, that his death was real and it paid the penalty for your sin and his resurrection is real and that as you get to know Jesus more you believe adoring him will transform your heart in a way in which you never ever could so we're going to pray and I want to give you the opportunity, maybe it's the first time in your life and I would even just say, if this is the first time in your life to ever say yes to Jesus, I want to invite you first. Not Nobody else looking around but me and a couple of people on, on, our, on our team here at Fusion. But just lift your hand up say, I'm ready to say yes to Jesus Christ as my Savior. If there's anybody here, we want to celebrate that. You don't have to be ashamed of that. Anybody at all? Praise God. A few hands around the room. Anybody else? You're not alone in this. There's a celebration that will ensue. Praise God. You're ready to say, yes, I believe Jesus Christ is my Savior. For some of you, keep those hands up. For some of you, you'd say, you know what? I've wandered away. I've turned my back. I know what I, I know. I believe this at once, but I've kind of done my own thing. I've chased my heart, and it led me away from God, which is what it always does, folks. You follow your heart, it'll lead you away from God. It won't lead you to Him. You say, I'm ready to rededicate. I'm ready to sign up again. I'm ready to say, yes, I believe God. I want to put Him back at the priority of my life. Go ahead and raise your hand up. Say, I need to rededicate my life to Jesus Christ. I need to say yes once again. Raise your hand up and join those who put it up. Praise God. Church, I want to invite you. Would you, would you stand with me? We're going to pray together. And I want to invite you just to repeat after me. There's no magic words. This is not something we do. This is something we respond to. There's a difference. Jesus has already done it. It's finished on the cross. The gift has been placed on the table in front of us. We just slide it over and we begin to open it. We say, yes, this is what I want. So let's bow our head and just, just repeat after me. These words convey what Scripture tells us about faith. That it sets us free, not in our power, but by the power of God at work. So just say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I say yes to you as Savior of my life, my Redeemer. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, for providing a way for me to have a relationship with you again. I believe Jesus lived, that he died, and that he rose again, and he pays for my sin. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me, God. May your Holy Spirit reside within me. I want to spend eternity with you. Lord Jesus, we celebrate this moment right now as your word tells us that a party ensues in heaven every time one lost child of God comes back home. There's a celebration happening because that faith decision has been made that breaks the chains. It breaks the chains off of hands. It, it sets captives free. It tears walls down around our hearts. And your Holy Spirit dwells and inhabits your people. We become the temple of the living God. Everywhere we go, you're with us. 
every thought we have, every temptation we face, your presence is there, your strength is there, a strength to transform unlike we've ever experienced in our own power. And God, we just thank you for that. That's what the, the life that you've created us for, is a life living communion with you. So we celebrate that. God, we celebrate those who have rededicated their lives that have said, you know what, I, I got off the train a while ago. And maybe, God, it just became a routine for them. It became tradition or religion or ritual. And and they kind of stepped aside and they followed their heart and it led them far from you. And now they're coming back into the understanding. This is a relationship thing. This is a daily choice to say, yes, God, I trust you. Yes, God, I know you love me. Yes, I look at the cross and I see your love on display. Father God, we worship you. We thank you that you changed lives. Thank you that you transform us, not just once in salvation, but you continue to transform us as we walk in relationship with Jesus. Because God, we know we don't have that power to do it ourselves. We echo the words of Psalms, create in us a clean heart, God, and a contrite spirit within us, submissive to your plan, your will, your way, your law. We would say with humility, God, you're right, we're wrong. Because after all, you're the one that created it. And you're the one that redeems it. And you're the one that's one day returning again. Conquering king, champion. We thank you, Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Would you join me in celebrating that there are people here that are now brothers and sisters in the kingdom, the family of God.